So you now say salam. Salam alaikum, everybody. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تهنوا ولا تحزنوا وأنتم الأعلون إن كنتم مؤمنين إن يمسسكم قرح فقد مس القوم قرح مثله وتلك الأيام نداولها بين الناس وليعلم الله الذين آمنوا ويتخذ منكم شهداء والله لا يحب الظالمين رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد ونسى كنا ببدي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Today inshallah we're going to try to do some study of ayahs number 139 and 140 of Surah Ali Imran That's where we are in our series um, These are still continuing the ayat of Ali Imran, Allah commenting on them uh, About the ayah we're about to study uh, I'll give you a brief translation first of, you know, a shallow translation and then we'll dig deeper Allah says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't be weakened or don't feel weak. Uh, don't be sad. And you are the most supreme. You are in the highest position if in fact you are believers. That's a rough translation of the ayah. About this ayah, there are many narrations about when it was revealed. Some hold the view um, and they even attributed this to Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. If you recall when I was talking about the battle of Uhud, after the losses we suffered, there was a time when there was, it was rumored that the Meccans are thinking about coming back for a second wave attack. And before they could come back, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the already injured Muslims to go after them. So go on the offensive instead of wait for them to be on the defensive. And it is at that point, of, it's attributed to Ibn Abbas that he said that at that time this ayah was revealed. That we're, we're looking at where Allah says, don't be weak, don't be sad, you're going to be the most supreme if in fact you are believers. The problem with that is, when you, uh, you know, if, if you study kind of the tahqiq, the research on that narration, there is no isnad, meaning it's said that it's from Ibn Abbas, but nobody knows how it's from Ibn Abbas. There's no chain of narration. So it's not a reliable, you know, explanation of when this was given. Generally, um, a more plausible explanation of when this ayah was revealed, عن الزهري وقتادة أنها نزلت تسلية للمسلمين لما نالهم يوم أحد من القتل والجراح. Meaning after the battle of was it done? either immediately after or later on as part of the larger group of ayat, it, was, it came down as a consolation to the Muslims because of what hit them, of the death toll and the injuries that they suffered, of course, including the injuries coming to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The other important thing here is that, you know, for some people that read the Book of Allah very literally, that every time Allah commands something or forbids something, by the way, is that Maryam I hear? I think it's Maryam, I, I know her voice. Maryam Bibi, I hear you. Okay, um, kids, what are you going to do? Okay, so what was I saying? Something about Islam. The thing is, in, when people read the Quran literally, if Allah forbids something, that means it's haram. And when Allah commands something, it means it's fard, like you have to do it, right? So if He forbids something, it's forbidden. Or He says don't, that means it's forbidden. If He says do it, then you have to do it. But it's not that simple all the time. Uh, in fact, in language, a lot of times, when you command someone to do something, it may not mean a command. When you tell someone, don't something, then it may not mean prohibition. So for example, if, you, if a child was crying, and I came over and you know, kind of gave them a hug and said, don't be sad. If I said that, I'm not telling them, you better not be sad. If you get sad, you see what do I do to you, because haram for you to be sad. That's not what I mean. I'm, being, I'm giving consolation, right? So don't be sad grammatically is a prohibition. It's, you know, it's, it's a negation. It, it's, it's literally stopping someone from doing something. But the, the, the issue isn't this is halal or haram. The reality of it is Allah is simply saying as a consolation, meaning to make the believers feel better, to encourage them. I don't want you to be sad. I don't want you to be weakened. So it's tasliya. It's called, you know, it's a condolence really that's being offered in the ayah. 
والظاهر أن حقيقة النهي غير مرادة منها That's what Imam Al-Alusi says also That the obvious is that it's not literally a command That's not what's being said here بل المراد التسلية والتشجيع But the intention is to give some sort of condolence And to make them feel better And to encourage them Because you will be supreme if in fact you are believers That's at a, at a surface level what's been said about the, the context of this ayah But let's dig a deeper because this is one of those worldview ayat uh, typically, I don't do Facebook Live or live sessions of uh, these Quran series, but you know, sometimes as we come across ayat that I feel like, you know, yeah, the, the Ali Imran series is like, you know, a couple of hundred hours eventually, or 80 hours or 100, I don't know, I lost track of time. But however many hours it is, I don't want someone to go through that much to find this ayah, you know. So if there's some, some ayat that I feel like everybody should know, or as many people should know about as possible, even if they're not engaged in a study of the entire surah, I decided to kind of pull that out and do a live session on it. Um, so this is one of those ayat. It's, it actually cre it contains in it a very powerful worldview. And to understand that, and I hope I can articulate that to you today, uh, the first thing I want to do is take that first phrase, وَلَا تَهِنُمْ Don't be weakened. The, 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 the first thing we should know about that is what this, this word weak, you know, what's the etymology of it? What does it come from in the Arabic language? They say in Arabic, رَجُلٌ مَوْهُونٌ فِي الْعَظْمِ وَالْبَدَنِ They say a person has wahan, a man has wahan, when a person's bones or his body, his muscles have become weak. Wahan al-azm, for example, bones becoming brittle. When something loses its strength from the inside, that's actually called wahan. So weakness that emanates from within is called wahan. تَوَهَنَ um, الطَّائِرِ They use the word for birds. If, the, if birds eat something that makes them sick and they can't fly anymore, then that bird is experiencing wahan. Because it can't even get up and fly anymore, so it's lost its ability. So, for example, this is about birds. So, generally speaking, the meaning of it is actually, um, uh, you know, what used to be a capability or a toughness on the inside has become softer. Now, what this is containing, the reason I thought this was important, by the way, the Quran uses this for. You know, the old age of Zakaria alayhi salam, وَهَنَ الْعَظْمُ minni. Right, my bones have become so brittle, they're rebelling against me. That's actually what the phrase implies. On the other hand, Allah uses it for a spider's web. إِنَّ أَوْهَنَ الْبُيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ The weakest of the homes, the most brittle homes, is the home of the spider. Right, so the idea that it's inherently weak, it can break easily. Right? Now Allah uses that word, and let's understand from a, from a psychology point of view, the impact of that word, and the, and the context in which it is placed. You see, the Sahaba are, uh, you know, once they come to Medina, there's hope. Because Mecca was a hopeless situation. Now we come to Medina and there's hope. And now the Prophet ﷺ is also actually the governor of Medina. So he's in a position of authority. And on top of that, the first battle that has happened with the Quraysh went in our favor. Right? Um, and Allah wanted to, for us to go against the harder enemy, which means that the battle of Badr instead of the caravan of Abu Sufyan, and we won that battle by Allah's help. So the spirits are high, and we're kind of getting used to, you know, this more victory. And we go with that same morale. Now we are more than three times that number into Uhud. And the ayat that have been given so far, before we get to this ayat, this is 139. The conversation started at 121, 121, 122. That's where it started. Then Allah was talking about where, where it began. Allah was talking about the morning of the battle, before things happened. Now we are at a point where Allah is not talking about the beginning. Look back and learn. Now He's talking about how do you look ahead. Now, now it's actually looking ahead. So from this ayah on, we're looking ahead, actually. And then he's going to come back and look back again, and then make us look ahead again. That's the style of the Qur'an. So anyway, looking back, you know, to, to give by analogy to tell you, if somebody gets used to winning, right? If somebody gets used to winning, and then all of a sudden they lose, right? Then it's pretty demoralizing. What just happened? They get shaken up. I know it's a terrible analogy, and I probably shouldn't give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. So you have these movies, right? Where there's a boxer who's used to winning all the matches, right? And then one time he just gets hit and he's like, what just happened? He gets thrown off. And he's, he's not won, he's not lost yet. He's still stronger, he's still more able, but in his head he's broken. 
Like it's a psychological war before it's any other kind of war. And that's a metaphor for life. And I've, those of you that are going to start commenting about what movie that is, Astaghfirullah al Okay? But anyway, the point, is, the point that I'm trying to make is that when you're used to things going right, and you have high expectations and high hopes and the Rasul of Allah is with us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he made dua for us and he put his armor on and there are all these signs that things are going to go well and then things fall apart and completely shatter and the Prophet himself is almost killed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's pretty demoralizing I mean, it's pretty natural to feel like weak on the inside and broken like what just happened it, it comes and hits you out of nowhere Allah had he wanted none of this would have happened if Allah wanted, the angels would have come, like they did in Badr, and before a Sahabi could swing his sword, they would have been they would have been burnt. That's what they described at, at, at Badr. He could have done that at Uhud too, but he wanted the Muslims to experience this difficulty. This was part of the plan. You see, these ayat of the Quran, these ayat of the Quran were are, are the, the word of Allah that Allah says, "Ala wa Quranan farqnahu li taqraahu ala nasi ala mukthin." This is a Qur'an, this is a recital that we broke it apart so we could reveal it to you at the right occasion. So there, this circumstance had to exist because these ayat had to give us timeless guidance not just for the events of Uhud but for until you know, Muslims are going to be around on earth. They're going to need guidance. And so these events had to happen. It had to happen this way. Which means Allah is teaching us that there, there has to be difficult you know, disappointing, devastating events in life. And if Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the best of the people, the Sahaba, were not spared devastation, if they were not spared the most horrible experiences, then you and I shouldn't think, I pray, I make dua, I don't do anything haram, why does bad stuff happen to me? Right? That's not a question anymore, because Allah has actually created these circumstances for the best of people. Who are we? And they're being given a lesson in this most devastating circumstance. And they're being told not, don't be weak. Go back a little bit further. You remember when we talked about suppressing anger a few, you know, a week ago? When we talked about suppressing anger, I didn't say, Allah doesn't say don't be angry. Because, you know, if somebody's angry and you say to them, don't be angry, they'll be like, okay, gone. <clears throat> no, it doesn't work that way. If somebody's really sad and they're crying, you say, don't cry. They're like, doesn't work that way. When you have feelings inside, you can't just erase them. So when Allah here says, don't feel weak, oh, I'm strong now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. What Allah is saying is, tabu. It's, it's actually, this is what Imam Al-Rusiya says. If you don't, if you understand this to mean actual prohibition, look at the genius of what he says. In al ma min al ala Meaning, don't be weak means don't let your weakness consume you so you act as if you are already defeated. Don't be weak doesn't mean that you're not feeling weak on the inside, that you're not feeling powerless on the inside, but don't let that powerlessness define you. That's an experience you have to go through, but it's not who you are. You know, sometimes we go through a bad experience and we start defining ourselves by that experience. You know, some somebody who's... And kids do this to each other, by the way, because, you know, I don't know anything about video games, but... Astaghfirullah. Um, kids are playing, and if one kid is used to winning all the matches, like they're playing Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat or something, and they're winning, and they're winning, and they're winning, and they're like, what happened, huh? Huh? Can't win, huh? Can't win, huh? And then one time they lose, and so the kid goes, you're a loser. You, I won a hundred times, but that one time, that loser sticks in my head, like, I am a loser. And the next time I play, I'm, I'm already lost in my head. Don't let this get to your head. Don't let this lo loss become a loss on the inside. That's actually a bigger loss. So don't expect, you, you know, don't accept that softness on the inside. Toughen up. Put yourself back together. Yes, it's hurt. Yes, it's difficult. But get up. And that's the first words that Allah says, لا تهنو. Then He says, ولا تحزنو. He says, and don't, they translate this as, don't be sad. Al-Huzn, which is commonly translated as sadness, actually comes from Huzun. Uh, which is one of the words in Arabic for al-jibal, mountains. And anything that has toughness or rigidness or discomfort in it, gets associated with huzn, meaning don't develop negative feelings. Sadness is one of them. Defeatism is another, that's a, that's a part of huzn actually. But you know, uh, feeling hopeless is another part of huzn. 
Feeling angry and resentment at yourself is also another part of Khusn. Khusn is a number of negative, any score of rough emotions or rigid emotions are Khusn. On top of all of that, look at the sequence. First, don't feel weak and don't become hardened with difficult or with negative emotions, meaning don't let this crystallize inside you so you just become a negative person in your outlook. You see, the, the universal lesson, not just for the Sahaba at that time, which is powerful, but all for all of us is we're going to go through some kind of uhud in our life where people around us that we love are going to get hit or we're going to get hit. And it's going to come out of nowhere. And we, we had all these hopes and expectations and they're going to get shattered and we're going to get shaken up like we've never been shaken up before. وَزُلْزِلُوا The people before us, the earth beneath their feet was shaken. Everything was falling, falling apart. Everything was taken from them. And at that point, at that point, it is, this is actually the other battle. I keep referring this to you. There are three battles, right? There's the battle against the enemy. There's the battle of evil within the Muslim society that has to be fought, the enemy. And there's a third war, the third battle happening inside. This is the battle on the inside now. Don't lose this battle. Because this, this, this is actually what makes a person victorious or a failure. The worldview of the Muslim is that everything in this world is simply la'ibun wa lahun. It's, it's a game and it's entertainment, meaning the ups and downs of this world are just cycles. The only thing that really matters before Allah and eventually when nothing else will matter, when all of this is reduced to nothing, the only thing that will matter is where, where, the, where was the heart? That's actually what the trial is. So now Allah has tested us with fear. Allah has tested us with bravery. Allah has tested us in different circumstances, the Sahaba. But now they're being tested with overwhelming grief and sadness and defeat. That's their next test. Can they hold on to their faith when they go through defeat? When they go through such an overwhelming, negative, you know, dark cloud above them? And so he says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا then he adds, وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ You are the highest. And while you are the highest, Allah is saying, you think you lost and the enemy won. They walked away with your shields and swords. They walked away laughing at you. The, you know, uh, Abu Sufyan was at the bottom of the hill saying, يَوْمٌ لَكُمْ وَيَوْمٌ لَنَا A day for you, a day for us. What's he talking about? Badr was for you, or Khud is for us. He talked trash to us. You know, لَنَا الْعُزَّةَ وَلَا عُزَّةَ لَكُمْ We have the female goddess Uzza. You don't have Uzza. So they said, you know, and Hubal, their god Hubal, they, he praised their gods that helped them on the day of Uhud. You know, that's the trash talk they did. When the Prophet ﷺ was up on the hill, if تُسْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْمُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ That those ayat are coming. So, you know, it feels like defeat. It feels humiliating. By the way, the word highest, al-a'laun, that's the superlative form. A'la in Arabic, higher. Al-a'la, highest, the highest. You are the highest. How are we the highest when we just suffered a defeat? You know, it's a, what a thing to say. Don't be sad. Oh, don't feel weak. Don't, be, don't let sadness get to you. Don't let these negative emotions eat away at you. You're in the highest position. How are we in the highest position? Allah, has, and by the way, to be in the highest position means two things. One, when someone's victorious, they're high. And when someone loses, they're low. So he's as if he's saying no one is higher than you, no more is more no one's more victorious than you are. That's one comment. The other of being high is actually being honored. The more the more honored someone is, the higher they are. Right? So, you know, that's why judges are honorable judge, but they also call them your highness. You know? So or, or royalty is called your highness, right? So this idea of height is actually associated with honor. Obviously, when, you're, when you lose a battle, one, you didn't win, so you're low. Two, it's humiliating, so you're low. But Allah says you're the highest. How, how in the world are we the highest? That's answered by the final comment of this ayah, in kuntum mu'mineen, if in fact you are believers. If in fact you are believers. Now, that portion, if in fact you are believers, has been attached in two ways. So let's understand both. One understanding is, لا تهنوا ولا تهنوا ولا تحزنوا إن كنتم مؤمنين. And there's an اعتراض. There's a sentence in between. What that means is, don't feel weakened. Don't let the insides defeat you. Don't feel defeated on the inside. And don't be overwhelmed with negative emotions. Don't do that to yourselves. If in fact you have faith. If in fact you believe. What is it that you believe? 
What you and I believe is that this life has nothing to do with victory and loss. You know, losing and gaining and losing, it's called taghabun in Arabic. And he says, يَوْمَ يَجْمَعُكُمْ لِيَوْمِ الْجَمْعِ ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ التَّغَابُنِ The day he gathers you for the day that's meant for gathering, that's the day of winning and losing. That's the actual day. This is not winning and losing. There's a larger grand scheme of things. There's a grand scheme of things. And we understand that. And that's why these smaller things, they don't make as much of a big deal to us. Let me put this in perspective for you. The, 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 the alone mindset that this ayah wants a believer to have. And well, how that changes the, you know, their lifestyle. How that changes their mindset. How that changes the every day. It changes their, their attitude every single day. Look, we're going to get hit with things that cause us sadness, grief. You know, and they're, they're, if you can say that these people went through a traumatic experience, you know, when soldiers go through gory experiences in battle, they suffer from PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And the trauma of that battle and the trauma of losing loved ones, those are all serious things. And the trauma isn't just for the soldiers that are on the battlefield, it's for the families who lost a father, a son, a brother, etc. They're all traumatized too. So this is a pretty big thing. What Allah Azza wa Jal does in the Quran, He doesn't dismiss it. But he puts something much bigger in front of him. So I'll, I'll help you understand that by way of analogy. Uh, this is an analogy I gave a long time ago, but I'll repeat myself. Just because it's, it helps you gain a sense of perspective. You have a person who is completely bankrupt. They got no money. They've got no hope. They're homeless. Homeless, bankrupt, looking through the trash for food. And one day a lawyer finds them. Says, I thought I'd find you here. Hey, you have an uncle uh, that put you in his will and in 30 days you're going to you know this house and this his bank accounts are being transferred in your name this is you right like, yeah that's me and he signs the papers in 30 days he's going to be a millionaire right he's not a millionaire right now when's he a millionaire 30 days he's guaranteed he's given him okay and he's got he's got a mansion he's got cars he's got businesses that make their own money he never has to work a day in his life nothing but for those 30 days, he's not a millionaire. For those 30 days, he's still homeless. He's still eating out of trash. Nothing has changed. But somehow, the freezing weather isn't that cold. And somehow the food that he's eating doesn't taste that bad. And somehow he's not complaining. The circumstances have not changed at all. And the bad things that happened to him have not changed at all. All of the negative experiences of his life are exactly the same. What's, what's different? What's different is there's something lying in his future and he absolutely believes it's waiting for him. He believes that and it's changed his entire world view. His other friends that live on the street, they're eating the same rotten apple and he's like, <laughs> and they're like, what's wrong with you? Why are you so happy? <laughs> and he just shows them a letter. They go, what's that? Don't worry about it. Something good is coming. Oh, by the way, even if he never gets to see that, if he dies before those 30 days, does he die sad or happy? Oh, he dies happy. He dies happy. The point is, there's something coming ahead. There's some meeting coming. There's some victory coming. And when you're convinced of that, you could go through the biggest problems, they're not that big anymore. They become small in comparison to something coming. فَمَا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ the things you're going to put to use in this world, compared to the next life, they're nothing but very little. Allah says in this ayah, don't be saddened, don't be weakened. Don't, don't, don't lose heart over these things. This will come and go. I want to see how much you believe in that. In kuntum mu'mineen. If in fact you have real conviction of what real victory and real loss is, then this will not affect you. And if it is affecting you too much, you know what that means? That means you haven't understood or realized what a big thing waits for you ahead. Maybe your faith in that isn't strong enough. Maybe that's what you need to focus on. Now understand that these trials will come, these victories will come. And it's part of, it's, it's part of, you know, it's to be human. Even the Prophet ﷺ was overwhelmed with grief. So we're not being told, don't be sad. We're not being told, don't be weak. We're being told, don't be overwhelmed by it. Don't let that overrun you. You are in the highest position anybody else can be in. These people don't have what you have. You know, they, they can win, like they, they think equal, right? You guys got Badr, we got Uhud, the score is tied. It's not tied, because you've always been the highest. You've always been advantages. When you win, you have advantage. When you lose, you have advantage. 
You can't lose because you have Iman. So it's in fact, you know, you know, the word if you believe is actually almost like a ta'leel. Ta'leel in Arabic means a rationale. You know, for example, if you say, if you're, if you're a good student, you're going to work hard. You're going to finish the homework by 8 p.m. if you're a good student. You know what that means? Because you're a good student, you're going to finish it by 8 p.m. So the if sometimes implies because. The idea here is you are supreme because you're believers. Because in fact you're believers. That's one of the ideas that's being communicated. Our faith is being tied directly to our internal response to difficult situations. That's actually what's happening here. You know, when a person if, accepts defeat on the inside, even if you study you know, uh, physiology and the relationship between physiology and psychology, there are certain chemicals that are released in our body that actually decrease our confidence, our shoulders drop, we feel more negative. There are re responses that we have that are not very different from an the animal kingdom. They have such responses too. After, winning a, after losing a fight between animals, they release certain chemicals in their body and our, chem our body releases the same kinds of chemicals because in their head they've accepted defeat. So the next time the same animal fights, it's already half lost. It's not ready for the next battle anymore. And the one that wins actually has increased confidence even more than its actual physical strength. It takes more risks, is more confident, more upright, etc. What Allah is teaching us is that we have something inside us, this faith that gives us an optimism regardless of the outside situation. We're able to overcome the negativity because of our faith. This is why you are in the highest position. I'm reminded remarkably of, um, of the Pharaoh. Fir'aun was, you know, Allah says, Inna Fir'auna ala fil ardi. That's a, it's the verb that comes from the same origin. The Pharaoh was very high powered in the land, meaning he looked down, down at people. You can imagine him in this castle looking down from his balcony at thousands of soldiers. You know, nobody looks at him in the eye. You look at him in the eye, you're dead. That's, that was the Pharaoh. But what did Allah say about him? Allah says about him, وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَمَانَ وَجُنُودَهُمَا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ He says Allah intended to show him and his general and their armies what they are always been afraid of. He's living in a castle. He's the most powerful political figure on planet Earth. Nobody can question. He calls himself a god, but he goes to sleep afraid. Like all that castle, all that power... And Allah says, inside of him, there's a fear. He goes to sleep with every night. Anxiety. Can't go to sleep. Sometimes people have everything on the outside. And they, there's a hell they're paying for on the inside. They have to take all kinds of drugs and medications to escape the hell they're experiencing on the inside. Because they're not victorious on the inside. But they look victorious on Instagram. Or they look victorious on social media. They look victorious in pictures or in the material things around them. But they're not victorious at all. You know, it's just a facade. Allah describes what real victory is. This is the Muslim concept of the Qur'an's concept of victory. It has nothing to do with the battlefield. As a matter of fact, the most beautiful thing in Arabic, the most beautiful, is called Al-Husna. Al-Husna. Like, Falahu al asbaul husna right? The most beautiful, the most beautiful names. In Surah At-Tawbah, in case we win or in case we, we lose, Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَى الْحُسْنَيَنِ are you waiting for us? The enemy, tell the enemy, are you waiting on us? Because what's going to end up with us? One of, two, one of the two most beautiful things. Meaning, if we win for Allah's sake, it's the most beautiful thing. And if we lose for Allah's sake, it's also the most beautiful thing. You can't beat us. We are al-a'lawn no matter how you go. This is, al, al, you know, so this is antum al-a'lawna in kuntum mu'mineen. Now look at the next ayah. It says, in yam saskum qarhun. If an injury has touched you. This is the language. If an injury has touched you. Now let's <coughs> dig a little bit further. The word jarh in Arabic with a jeem is used for an injury that penetrates the skin, maybe even reaches the bone. Okay? The jawarih are animals that bite into their prey and tear them apart. Jarrah in old Arabic was used also for the surgeon because he tears open the organ and he goes inside. So a jarh is an injury that goes deep inside. As opposed to that, a qarh with a qaf is actually a, like a scab or it's like a rash or it's like a boil and you're, you know, you're, it's a surface level, it's skin level. 
It's not going deep inside surgically. It's an irritation on the skin surface. Okay, so that's what a qarh is as opposed to a jarh. This, what just happened at Uhud, should feel like a jarh. Allah says, "I am saskum qarh." If uh, an irritation has touched you, not even if an irritation has debilitated you. Massa, it can be used in harsh and light meanings, but going with the flow of the ayah, if this is just a scratch, don't worry about it. If you got scratched a little bit, so what? You're so demoralized by this? فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ بِثْنُهُ Then the people, meaning Quraysh, a, 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 a scratch has touched them too. Meaning, you, you lost 70 or so in Uhud. They lost 70 or so in Badr. So Allah is saying, you think you're having a hard time? And you're like, if I'm a believer, why am I having a hard time? Allah says, this has nothing to do with you being a believer. I gave them this hard time last time. And in the grand scheme of things, this doesn't amount, amount to nothing more than a what? A scratch. Like this is Allah's point of view on something that's so drastic to us. It's the end of the world to us, and Allah puts it in a different perspective. It's hard for a believer, but it's a, it's a struggle we have to engage in to reorganize and resize issues to the way Allah wants us to resize, resize them. Now there's an old Arabic saying, كَبِّرْ هَا تَكْبُرْ صَغِرْ هَا Make something big, it'll become a big deal. Make something small, it will remain insignificant. Allah wants, for us, some things to be a big deal, right? And we should. And what's crazy is the things Allah wants us to make a big deal out of, we don't make a big deal out of them at all. And the things Allah wants us to keep small, we make them into a huge deal, right? So we have a disproportion from the kind of sense of proportion the Quran wants. Using the word qarh is Allah suggesting a sense of proportion. This may be devastating for any other human, you know, being, or any other society, any other group. But you people have iman. You people have iman. You need to get back up. And let me tell you this, those people got hit with it. And by the way, it's not just you got injured or you lost or you lost people. You, it's demoralizing, it's humiliating. The great Quraysh went back at Badr and people were saying, what, you lost to them? To those homeless people? To those we kicked out from Mecca? You lost to them? Are you serious? Abu Sufyan, the governor of Mecca, can't show his face. Like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna face the public after losing a war? It happens today too, right? If a president or a governor or a politician, a president loses a war, clearly loses a war, is he going to be able to show his face in public? Is he going to get reelected? It's humiliating, isn't it? And so they're humiliated. And just like that, we're feeling it now. Allah says, what did they do, basically? What did they do with their loss? They went back and for a year they fundraised and prepared and came back with a vengeance. And that's what Uhud was. Three times the number, way more the resources. They came prepared. And this time they came all the way to Medina. They came all the way to Uhud, which is practically Medina. Not just a battlefield in between, right? So they, were, they came ready. Allah is saying people who don't even have Allah, people who don't even have the Akhirah, people who don't even have Iman, who only have this world, ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ You know, مِنَ الْعِلْمِ This is all they know is this world. Look at how fired up they were after defeat. Look at how they picked themselves up. And you... Believers who are supposed to be supreme, you're thinking, why is this happening to us? Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Don't do this to yourself. If a, if a, if a, an irritation or a skin injury has touched you, a cut has got to you, then it's cut them too. It's already cut them too. And then he says, nas. This is the worldview now. He says, those days, those days, we feel we keep interchanging between people. Dawul actually means to pass something from one to another, to another, to another, to another. And dawala, the mufa'ala form, means for someone to, like if I, for example, I'm not touching it, but I say to Ahmed, I say, hey, pass this to, you know, pass this to the person next to you, 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 and they're passing it to each other, that's called dawul, or dawla, or dula in Arabic. Mudawala means Allah makes victory Pass between people. He makes that happen between people. He doesn't keep victory with one group. Doesn't matter if they're believers or not. Which means being politically or militarily or economically victorious has nothing to do with al-a'laun. 
Al-A'laun has to do with Iman, it has to do with faith. So to be the highest, it has to do with faith, not with the material. Yes, the material has been promised, but how does Allah promise it? Allah says, for example, in Surah Al-Saf, which is a surah of the, uh, also related to, to Uhud. He says, Should I tell you of a trade that will save you from painful punishment? And one of the painful punishments is the Quraysh could attack any time. It's not just hell. He says, <laughs> Let me give you a trade. You believe in Allah and the Messenger. And struggle in Allah's path with your monies and yourselves. That's better for you. And then he says, وَأُخْرَى تُحِبُّ نَصْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ And secondarily, something you love also is aid from Allah and victory, meaning worldly victory. That's priority number two. It's not the big deal. The real victory is your iman inside. That's the real victory. And so here he again you know, clarifies that reality. He says, تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامْ نُدَاوِلُهَا Now in Arabic, those of you that are familiar with some grammar and some rhetoric, you could say, نُدَاوِلُ تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامْ Nudawilu tilka layam. But the Quran says, Tilka layam, nudawiluha. And the Bamir comes back to the ayyam. Those days, we flip them around. We pass them around between people. So there's an emphasis on days. Now, this could be for a number of reasons. When you use the word days, and they're being passed around, which means one day for them, one day for them, one day for them, isn't it? That teaches the believer to understand good times are never permanent, bad times are never permanent. They're just days, and they have to be passed around. There were days of joy for the Prophet ﷺ, there were days of great sorrow for the Prophet ﷺ. There are going to be days of joy, periods of joy, periods of sadness. It has to happen. This is Allah's plan for people that will live on this earth. They will be given good, and they will be given tough times. We're gonna test you with good and with bad. It's gonna, you're gonna get hit with both. You have to experience both. And so he says, our, you know, by the way, the word day is also prominent because what did Abu Sufyan say? That day was for you, this day is for us. Allah says, no, these days we, Allah responds. He says, these days we flip between people. And that's not because, oh, this time Allah loves us, huh? That's why we won. That's the other misconception, people who believe in God, not just Muslims, Christians, Jews, others, anybody who believes in God can develop this misconception. If God loves you, he'll give you a good life. If God loves you, you won't have any problems. So when you get a promotion, you're like, God, God's been good this year. You know? When you get a you know, diagnosis and the, the cancer is gone, you're like, God's been pretty good to me. But when you get a termination notice or you get fired or money problems, why is God must be upset with me? What's going on? Like Allah is good to you if life looks good. Allah is not good to you if life doesn't look good. That's the formula. This is a materialistic sense of Allah. Like we don't view Allah in this way. In fact, Allah says, clarifies, He says, then why do I give you loss? Let me explain it to you. First of all, He said, you're only victor you're only consider yourselves victorious if in fact you can hold on to your faith, even under losing circumstances. That's the first thing. But in this ayah, He explains, He says, Allah ladina amanu. And so Allah will know who truly believes. And Allah will know who truly believes. Allah put us through this because He wanted to know, can we hold on to our faith when things are not going our way? Now some people have this problem with this, uh, you know, it's a theological problem. How can Allah say, so Allah will know? Allah already knows everything. But He says, لِيَعْنَمْ Allah, So that Allah will know. But why would Allah wait to know? He already knows. Right? And the way you understand that, simply speaking, is as follows. If I say to two of my kids, one is older, one is younger, I want to know which one runs faster. I bring them to the masjid, it's empty, I say, I want to know which one runs faster. Three, two, one, go. Do I want to know? No, I want them to compete. An expression, I want to know, from an authority, actually doesn't mean I need to know, it actually means prove yourselves to me. You're, we're looking at it from the point of view of Allah. Actually, this is supposed to be heard from the point of view of the slave. Allah says He wants me to prove myself. You know, sometimes we talk to Allah in dua and we say, Ya Allah, I really want you to know I'm sorry. Allah already knows. <laughs> but that's because you want to prove yourself to Allah. That language isn't blasphemous because you think Allah doesn't know. Of course everybody knows that Allah knows. You understand? So when He says, so that Allah will know, means let me put you to the test. 
who will still believe? You know, back in, I'm, I'm, I made a stikhbar from this a long time ago in 1996 when the Knicks lost the finals. But uh, I used to be a Knicks fan. Okay. And, um, you know, Spike Lee is a big Knicks fan. Spike Lee shows up at every game. He's got this giant Shahada finger and he's waving. We could be down by 45 points. He's still, you know, is, is waving the finger. He's just a fan. He's just, you know, he believes. They call, they, they call those fans true believers, you know? You know why? Because it doesn't matter if you win or lose, I still believe. There's still a 1% chance, you know? <laughs> that if they just make, you know, 23 pointers in a row in the next 20 seconds, we can win this thing. And he still believes. That's called a true believer, right? Allah says he wants to know, no matter how bleak the circumstances look, who's going to show me absolute conviction? Who's going to show me real faith? It's easy to believe when things are going well. That's easy to believe. That's easy to, it's easy to have Iman under those circumstances. How is it going to be easy to believe when things aren't going well? That's when people lose their faith. Allah says, I actually gave you a, a difficult circumstance, a scratch, because I could have made things way worse. It was just a scratch. This is just a bump. I gave it to you and I give it to others too. But for you, I gave it for the purpose to see if you can prove yourself as faithful. Because when we are hit with difficult times, what comes? Wahan, weakness. Huzn, negative thinking. And those, those two things the devil capitalizes on and says you need to do something to make yourself feel better, to make the, 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 the bad feelings go away, the negativity go away. When people are overrun with depression or anxiety or sadness, they turn to things that the devil wants them to turn to. They go to some kind of escape to make themselves feel better. That's when they turn away from Allah. Allah says, go through this and let me see if you can stay tall. Stand tall, standing. And he says, you know, and then he gives another purpose. And secondly, the reason I went through this exercise with you is because I wanted to take some of, some of you, from, from among you, I wanted to take shuhada, witnesses to me. Witnesses who gave their lives to me means martyrs. I wanted to take some of you for myself. In other words, some of you, I wanted to give the highest honor possible. That's the reason you went through this. What does Allah do? Allah takes the worst thing that happens in battle, which is death. That's the worst thing that happens in battle. And He turns it into the most beautiful thing. So Allah does. And it's remarkable in this ayah that first Allah mentioned us, the, the, the ones who survived. He said, I wanted to know who has real faith. And I wanted to take the shuhada. But the shuhada are mentioned second, as if they already passed their test. They are among, among them who already paid their dues, they already passed. You're the one still taking the test. You're the priority. That was, and then Imam al-Alusi and others commented on this beautiful thing. This is, a, this is one of those gems of the Arabic language that is so hard to communicate in English, and it's so profound. I hope I can communicate this to you. Notice, when you say in English, um, we flip these days between people so that Allah will know. So that Allah knows. So the word so that is li. But the Arabic here is not li, it's wa li. There's a wa. What does wa mean in Arabic? And. And. The wow is ma'atuf on a mahduf. What that means is there's something understood before the end that hasn't been said. Now but let me put that in simple English for you. Allah is saying, I put you through difficult circumstances for reasons that you will never know, they're for me to know and you to just believe. But for the, of the reasons you can know, is that I wanted to test your faith. And I wanted to take some shuhada from among you. But there are plenty of other reasons that you have no access to, they are only Allah's wisdom. And you're just gonna have to believe. You're, you don't have access. Allah is not doesn't owe you to inform you of all of the reasons for his plans in the unseen. Why, you know why this is important? Because when someone goes through a difficult time, when someone goes through a difficult time, Allah's immediate answer is the real reason this happened to you, there, there could be several reasons. I don't owe you an explanation for all those reasons. But the one reason you should know, if, if you're still alive, the one reason you should know is that I wanted to see how much you believe under difficult circumstances. This was all a test of your faith. The quality of your faith will be tested under difficult circumstances. How do you test if gold is pure? You have to melt it, right? 
That's the only way you'll know the value of it. When you, when you want to test the authenticity of something, you have to put it to the test. How do you know if, the, if it's steel or it's some, you know, some brittle material? You have to hit it against something hard. If it didn't break, then it's solid steel. So if you have quality faith, then it has to be put to the test. Then, then that's how it will be. It will prove itself. And so Allah gave us one reason, but not all the reasons. And that's a very powerful thing because you and I will go through experiences where we're going to be left asking, why did Allah put me through this? Why did I have to go through this? I don't understand what the wisdom behind that was. I don't understand His plan. He says, I don't owe you that. But I tell you one thing, one thing for sure, it was to see whether you still believe in me or not. Or you let go of your faith. And then He clarifies at the end, Wallahu la yuhibbu I love the conclusion of this ayah. And Allah, He doesn't love those who do wrong. In other words, those guys went away saying, God is on our side this time. Because people say, if Allah loves us and we're the believers, how come the kuffar have victory? How come the enemies of Islam get away with this, this, this? How come bad people are so happy? How come they're, they're, they're living a good life? Allah says, you must be confused. Just because they're smiling and walking away and acting victorious, you think that's an indication that Allah loves them? Allah doesn't love those who do wrong. Allah, in fact, He doesn't do, love those who do wrong. Worldly happiness and worldly, you know, the visible victory has nothing to do with who Allah loves and who Allah doesn't love. The other beautiful thing here, Allah never said He hates wrongdoers. Wallahu yakrahu ظالمين No. He simply says He doesn't love. He doesn't love. You know what that means? There's a difference between not loving and hating. Allah has actually in the Quran never used hate for people. The most He goes is He's angry at them. Sometimes he's angry at them. You know, he punishes them. But he doesn't say that he what? Hates them. He doesn't hate them. He doesn't hate them. He says he doesn't love certain groups of people because of their behavior. And by the way, it's not Allah doesn't love the Quraysh. Allah doesn't love Abu Sufyan. Allah says Allah doesn't love those who do wrong. In other words, if they stop doing wrong and they're still Abu Sufyan, then they don't. They can get Allah's love again, right? They can. They can earn Allah's love again. So, Subhanallah. Allah doesn't love the wrongdoers. Suggests not that He doesn't care about them, because even they breathe air. They get the rahmah of Allah. What that means is, don't you think that they're enjoying this victory because somehow Allah favors them? No, this is part of a process where you go. These days, go back and forth between people. Now, this these ayat are explaining how believers should respond to loss and defeat and difficult circumstances. What should be our attitude? Later on, Allah will explain, what, do you, what should you think about disbelievers or the enemies of faith when they experience victory? What is really going on? What's Allah's plan with them? Why are they? Okay, fine. I get it. I experienced loss because you wanted to test my faith. I got it. Why'd you give them victory? That's still a separate question, right? Later on in these ayat, it's that question. So you want to know why I gave them victory? You want to know why they walked away laughing? I could tell you that too. I won't tell you all the reasons, but among the reasons Allah will tell. With it, just like here, Allah didn't say all the reasons. Within the reasons Allah told, the same way He won't say all the reasons then, but within them, the ones we are, have some privy to know, Allah will inform us later on in these ayat Allah later on. So with that, inshallah ta'ala, I'll conclude today's dars. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh yeah, you, you do it. That's your job. Exactly, that's what I was coming over here for. Not say salam first. Oh, uh, assalamu alaikum. Okay.